from the historic campus of Hillsdale College in Hillsdale, Michigan, where the good, the true, and the beautiful are taught, nurtured, and honored, this is the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour, bringing the activity and education of the college to listeners across the country. Originalism can actually be very easily defined in one sentence, and that is the view that the meaning of the Constitution should remain the same until it's properly changed by amendment. It's very simple. It's an idea just so simple that it might just be right. And it's an idea that's been with us since the founding. This is your host, Scott Bertram. Welcome to the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour, part of the Hillsdale College Podcast Network. That was American legal scholar Randy Barnett. His brand new memoir is just out, A Life for Liberty, The Making of an American Originalist. We'll talk in depth with Randy about his story and the story of originalism in just a bit. First, we're joined by Dr. Joseph Postel. He is Associate Professor of Politics here at Hillsdale College. Dr. Postel, thanks for joining us. Great to be with you. Talking as the Republican National Convention is about to begin here in 2024 and thought it would be a good conversation to talk about the, the history of political conventions here in the United States and how they've changed adjusted through the years. How do we begin? How do political conventions get their start here in the U.S.? Yeah, so the uh, the idea of a political convention is hatched out of a really tumultuous period in American politics that we call the era of good feelings, but which uh, was actually not the era of good feelings. It was actually <laughs> a very nasty period in American politics, roughly, say, 1808 to 1824, uh, it's the one time in American history where we didn't have two parties. We really only had one viable political party in the country, and that was sort of the Jeffersonian Democratic Party. They called themselves the Republican Party back then, but they actually were the, the Democratic Party today. Mm -hmm. And um, the problem with that system was they really didn't have a good way to nominate presidential candidates because uh, you didn't really have a system in which somebody could be known throughout the whole country. And... Um, the the system for nominating candidates really wasn't devised by the Constitution. There's nothing in the Constitution about parties or right. nominations. And so they had to sort of figure this out after a really nasty election, 1824, where there were five candidates from the same party. This is the problem. When you have one party uh, and there's no opposition party, you essentially have multiple candidates from inside the same party trying to get the nomination and therefore the presidency. And so you had Andrew Jackson, John Quincy Adams... Uh, Henry Clay, John Calhoun, uh, William Crawford, all running for the for the presidency from the same party. And there really was no uniform system for nominating this candidate. So different states nominated their own candidates. And Andrew Jackson won the popular vote, but he lost the presidency because there was no majority in the Electoral College. Mm -hmm. This is an infamous corrupt bargain, uh, so-called, where Henry Clay sort of uh, as the Speaker of the House, gets the House of Representatives, which decides the presidency in the case of no majority in the Electoral College. Henry Clay sort of influences the House of Representatives to pick John Quincy Adams instead of Andrew Jackson. And so coming out of the sort of aftermath of this election, people realized we need a system for nominating candidates. This is going to keep happening over and over again. And so the convention is born out of that chaos. We should underline the fact, I think, that there's nothing constitutional about the process. It's not part, it's not written into law. The conventions then, the conventions now are strictly party-run apparatus. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, the founders aren't really thinking about these questions when they write the Constitution. They don't really even anticipate the rise of two parties. And so all of this really has to get worked out by experience after the fact. And it's not written into the Constitution. And that's why it's evolved so much over mm -hmm. time is because there is no fixed rule in the Constitution about how we do these things. You uh, allude a bit to this, but what was sort of wrong with the system that the conventions replaced, the, the, uh, the phrase King, King Caucus yeah. prior to the conventions? What, what, what was happening? What was wrong with it? So the phrase King Caucus refers to the Congressional Caucus. So this was the system before, say, 1824, where, you know, again, in the absence of a convention and a really strong two-party system, the best way they could th figure out to nominate presidential candidates was just have the elites in Congress nominate them. And so that's the one place where the party came together from all different parts of the country. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like a convention. It was just that the people in Congress were the sort of delegates in that kind of a system. And so 
you know, they all got together in Congress and they nominated candidates that way. Um, there's some there's some dispute among scholars about whether King Caucus really was the kind of quasi official mechanism for nomination. I think the big objection to King Caucus is that you're basically putting the election of the president in the hands of the Congress. Mm -hmm. And so in a time where, especially in the 1800s, early 1800s, people really were not afraid of the president being too strong. They were afraid of the Congress being too strong. And so you would end up with weak presidents who were basically just the, you know, sort of the, uh, the servants of the Congress. And so that was one problem with it. The other problem, of course, was it wasn't really binding. And so if you disagreed with the outcome in the caucus, at, in the congressional caucus, you could still run against your own party in the general election. And so King Caucus had a lot of different problems with it. It really was not a good way of bringing the whole party together in one national meeting and getting the sense of the party that way. So that's really why you need something like a, a convention. Talking with Dr. Joseph Postel about the history of political conventions here in the country. Uh, we know a candidate is nominated at a convention. Uh, what else happens, and has that changed through the years? The, the major thing that happens at a convention, other than the nomination of the candidate, of course, is the, the, dev, the devising of a party platform. Mm -hmm. And I teach my students these days about these things, and they really have only a vague understanding of what a party platform is. <laughs> I'm old enough to have been taught that the platform really is important. Yeah. And I think the way we understand the platform is a good illustration of what has happened to conventions over the years. The idea of the platform really is a relic of the 19th century version of political conventions. And the main difference between these two types of conventions is that in the 19th century, when the conventions are originally set up, the delegates have their own judgment. They basically get to decide who the candidate is and what the party platform, the planks of the platform mm -hmm. are going to be. And even just as you know, a basic matter, the platform, for those who aren't that familiar with it, is essentially the statement of the party's positions on all the major policy questions of the time. So are you for canals? Are you for the national bank? Do you like bimetallism or the gold standard? These are the big 19th century questions <laughs> that the parties were trying to hammer out through these uh, these platforms. Mm -hmm. And so the really important thing about the platform is that in the 19th century, when the delegates chose the candidates rather than, say, a primary system, you really had the platform first and the candidates second. And so the, the candidates were really secondary to what the party stood for in its mm -hmm. platform. And the candidates, of course, were bound to follow the will of the party expressed in the platform. We're going to spend time in around a month in a separate conversation talking about some of the most important consequential conventions through our nation's history. But briefly here, are there ever any surprises at these conventions? When's the last time, notable times, we've had a true open convention or, or even a brokered convention? Yes. Yeah, so the, the older s system, basically from, let's say, 1832 to 1972... Think of that period as the the period where the conventions were really dramatic. Mm -hmm. People actually might not know who the nominee is going into the convention. You would have these, what, what you refer to as brokered conventions, where there is no nominee who's sort of definitively been nominated before the convention. The delegates have to compromise. They have to trade votes. Sometimes a candidate will withdraw after like the second or third ballot and give all of their, their delegates over to another candidate. This used to be quite common in the 19th and early 20th centuries. So Abraham Lincoln is a sort of dark horse who comes out of nowhere in 1860. Uh, Woodrow Wilson in 1912 is nominated on something like the 37th or 38th ballot hmm. in Baltimore. It was quite ordinary for candidates to not even really be the, the front runner when they get to the convention, but somehow put together that majority. Today, of course, when the primaries nominate all the delegates and, and the delegates are essentially pledged to whoever wins the, the primaries, you have a system in which there really aren't very many surprises anymore. We really haven't had a brokered convention since 1952 in the Democratic Party. Although the interesting thing in light of contemporary events, what's going on in the country right now is the possibility that there might actually be one mm -hmm. this summer with the Democratic Party. And of course, they're still trying to figure all of that out as, as we're talking. But uh, even in 2016, there was some discussion of maybe the so-called superdelegates right. being involved in 
moving the Republican Party away from Trump, who was obviously someone who was not supported by the establishment part of the, the Republican Party. So sometimes you get sort of echoes of this brokered convention language, but usually it's just the media trying to write about this. <laughs> it usually doesn't pan out, although we'll wait and see what happens next month. Talking with Dr. Joe Postel from Hillsdale's Politics Department about the history of political conventions in the country. And now might be the perfect time for you to learn more about the meaning of the Constitution and the principles of American government. How, you ask? By taking Hillsdale College's free online course, Constitution 101. You can do it by going to hillsdale.edu slash course, C-O-U-R-S-E. Scroll down, you'll see the link for Constitution 101. It's a 12-lecture course examining the political theory of the American founding, the challenges to that theory throughout American history. More than 1 million Americans have taken Constitution 101. If you haven't, now is a great time to do so. If you have, maybe a refresher course. Find Constitution 101 at hillsdale.edu slash course. That's hillsdale.edu edu slash course, C-O-U-R-S-E, hillsdale.edu slash course. Scroll down to find Constitution 101. Continuing now with Dr. Joe Postel from Hillsdale's Politics Department as we look back on the history of American political conventions. Dr. Postel, this is more of a modern question because certainly... 100 plus years ago, of course, conventions were for the people at the convention. But now the question is, are these conventions designed for the people in the arena, the people who are present? Or are they designed for the people at home? And how has the rise of television, radio, and now digital media transformed the, the, the nature and also the reach of these political conventions? Yeah, the the conventions today are essentially in my estimation, sort of hollow versions of what they once were. So it used to be the case that you got to the convention and you knew there was going to be a fight over some major plank. It could be territorial expansion. It could be, you know, some major policy question. Today it would be things like for the Republicans, you know, the tariff, immigration. Um, and you would, you would sort of be ready for that fight at the convention. And it would be a very dramatic event. You weren't sure how it was going to play out. Uh, people would give speeches, and the speeches would move the convention in various ways. Mm -hmm. There would be deals brokered in these so-called smoke-filled rooms. And the idea here is that the party is deliberating collectively. All of the people in the party who come from the grassroots, they come from the localities and the states, are now at this national convention, and here's where we're going to deliberate on all these questions and come up with what we stand for as a party. Today, we've sort of flipped the script. And so everything is decided before the convention, and it's really not about the planks in the platform or the principles of the party. It's really about the presidential nominee. And so everything is now carefully orchestrated around making the presidential nominee look good. So instead of the parties being up over and above the candidates, we've sort of put the candidates over and above the parties. And so what conventions are these days are basically three day or so long cheerleading sessions in mm -hmm. which people give speeches, not to, not to the members of the convention hall, but to the American people talking about why their presidential candidate should win the election. You mentioned earlier Abraham Lincoln. People, of course, recall the speech that Barack Obama gave in 2004 at, at the Democratic National Convention. Have we seen past conventions like that produce rising stars and shine the spotlight on on members who are going to play a much bigger part in the future yeah i, I think obama in 2004 right it, he he's the sort of quintessential example of a modern presidential candidate who sort of comes out of nowhere doesn't have a long track record of experience but he gives a great speech and that sort of catapults him to national prominence and i think that is an illustration of the sort of modern orientation of a convention. It's really about the speech you can give rather than about your experience, how you've proven yourself to your colleagues in the party. So I think you'll see more and more of this going forward as long as conventions are a kind of way to give a great speech in support of the presidential candidate. Then, you know, the dozen or so people who give a speech at the convention in support of the presidential candidate are seemingly the people that you're watching to see if they could replace mm -hmm. that candidate in the, in four or eight years. So, you know, for Republicans, it will be 
whoever they sort of assign to speak in support of Donald Trump at the convention, those will be the sort of quote unquote rising stars in the party. And then some of them might give a really excellent speech and be thought of as, you know, sort of the, the heirs apparent to, to Trump. So that is definitely something you see in conventions today. And it becomes more about the speech you can give rather than, say, your experience or your track record. Talking with Dr. Joseph Postel, Associate Professor of Politics here at Hillsdale College about the history of political conventions here in the United States. What about the future of political conventions here in the United States? You already have told us a little bit about how the uh, the purpose has shifted through the years. Are they still really consequential in the span of a of a presidential campaign? Do you see a potential future with no political conventions? I think that's quite possible. We sort of really only do it these days as a matter of tradition. <laughs> I sort of joke with my students when I talk about these conventions that you, know, you see people like standing next to the Illinois sign or the Nebraska sign or the Georgia sign as if their state identity really matters, which these days your sort of local and state identity matters a lot less than your national party identification. And so it does seem a little bit like this traditional thing that we do because we've always done it. And the rationale really has has not survived the modern era. So I could see certainly in the near future a situation in which the conventions just become more trouble than they're worth. On the other hand, they clearly serve a new purpose now in the 21st century. They serve a purpose of getting a, say, very temporary and very small bump <laughs> in support for the for the party and the candidate, which has just held the convention. And so, you know, neither party is going to voluntarily relinquish that. Even if it's a small advantage they get, they're not going to give that up. So they'll probably keep doing it, even though I think the American people are increasingly less interested in what goes on here. I, I almost consider the political conventions now in the same way that we consider the Olympics. Like it's, it's a nice spectacle, and we've always done it this way, so we're going to have it. And people kind of get interested for a week and then forget. And I guess, of course, we'll do it four years from now because we've always done it this way. Yeah, I think that's actually quite a good analogy, right? I think there's a very similar reaction. And so, you know, if you really wanted to restore the conventions back to their original purpose, you would really want to revitalize these state and local parties. Mm -hmm where today the state and local parties basically don't have any funding, don't right. have really strong leadership or power. And until you get a return to that kind of a model of the parties, you're not really going to have conventions that matter very much. Have you been to a I've actually convention? never been to a convention, so I've only studied them in books. I probably should go, given that I teach and talk about them a lot. I made the trip to Cleveland. I had just actually arrived here at Hillsdale a few months before that convention in the summer of 2016, and went to Cleveland for a couple of days for the RNC. The uh, did, did some Radio Row stuff, obviously. And Radio Row was a converted parking garage. <laughs> so find space to put people. Yeah. But uh, much like you explained, I mean, once you're inside, there is an energy. And people are standing by their individual state signs and listening to speeches. And it does transform into a, a pep rally of sorts, right? Right. Yeah, it's almost like a conference for the party mm -hmm. to sort of rally and encourage, uh, just as you've just described. So it does play that kind of a role, which, again, is a very different role than the idea that we're all coming together to think about these serious questions and deliberate about them. So it does play that role, and I think for that reason even though it's not the same role it once had, is probably something the parties will continue to do. Dr. Joseph Postel is Associate Professor of Politics here at Hillsdale College. As we talk about the history of political conventions, we are looking forward to another conversation in roughly a month. This one just before the Republican National Convention. We'll talk again just before the Democratic National Convention in Milwaukee, this time about some of the most memorable, consequential and important political conventions in our country's history. Dr. Postel, thanks so much for joining us on the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Great to be with you. Up next, we talk with noted legal scholar Randy Barnett. His new memoir is out. It's called A Life for Liberty. I'm Scott Bertram. This is the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Hillsdale College is a small, 
Christian classical liberal arts college that operates independently of government funding. And we want you or your son or daughter to apply. At Hillsdale, students grow in heart and mind by studying timeless truths in a supportive community dedicated to the highest things. Hillsdale College costs significantly less than other nationally ranked private liberal arts colleges and receives regular recognition as a best value. And nearly all students receive financial aid. Our robust core curriculum, vibrant student life, and eight to one student to faculty ratio make for an education like no other. For more information or to fill out an application, visit hillsdale.edu backslash info. That's hillsdale.edu backslash info. Welcome back to the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. I'm Scott Bertram. Check out the Hillsdale College Podcast Network at podcast.hillsdale.edu. You'll find older episodes of this program plus plenty of other Hillsdale College audio. We're joined now by Randy Barnett. He is professor of constitutional law at Georgetown University Law Center. He directs the Georgetown Center for the Constitution and is the author of the new book, but of a memoir, A Life for Liberty, The Making of an American Originalist. Randy, thanks so much for joining us. It's always great to talk to you, Scott. The book looks back on your life and your journey to be where you are today. And I, I want to ask about the title, The Making of an American Originalist, uh, play on original, originalist. But that's a phrase that, of course, is very important to your story and where we end today what is originalism? What is originalist? How, how do you define it? Sure. Well, originalism can actually be very easily defined in one sentence, and that is the view that the meaning of the Constitution should remain the same until it's properly changed by amendment. The meaning of the Constitution should remain the same until it's properly changed by amendment. It's very simple. It's an idea just so simple that it might just be right. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's you know, some of the debate is in the details, but that's the basic idea. And it's an idea that's been with us since the founding. We'll come back to a bit about how you ended in this place and how influential that point of view now is on the Supreme Court. But this is a fun book, too, Randy, because it tells your life story. And, you know, early on, there's a lot of neat things about you growing up, playing in, in bands, which we've talked previously elsewhere about. But I, I love this story. And you can share a little bit of it with us about how you ended up selling ads at the Chicago Reader, an, an alternative newspaper in Chicago, and how that ended up being, in, in, in fact, a very profitable venture for you. Yeah, well, I tried to start my own newspaper. And one of the things that I noticed, you notice a lot of things when you write a memoir that you didn't even realize about yourself. One of the things I noticed was how many times I tried to start a newspaper in my life, <laughs> uh, you know. <laughs> when I was a little kid, then when I was a, a young kid, and then finally, when I was in college, I started a newspaper in my freshman year called The Alternative at Northwestern, which was a free newspaper. Uh, we actually managed to get one issue out the door before we all just sort of gave up in exhaustion and never did a second issue. We were a one-hit wonder <laughs> when it came to alternative newspapers. But um, then the next year, uh, all of a sudden, a newspaper shows up at Northwestern, a free newspaper sitting up in bundles that looks a lot like what we were trying to do called the reader, the Chicago reader. But I called these folks up on the phone. I was very interested in the idea because of what I had done. And I called them on the phone. I said, you're dumping the, the newspapers in the wrong locations. You need to put them here. You need to put them there. And when they had me on the phone, these guys who I found out were a group of uh, recent college graduates from Carleton College living in Hyde Park said, well, how would you like to be in sell advertising for us? So I had sold I had sold electronics, consumer electronics, when I was in high school. The book tells that story as well. And I said, well, sure, I'll give it a try. And I hitchhiked to various businesses in Evanston, downtown Evanston, and sold advertising. And eventually, because of my success, they asked me if I would want to be the advertising director, mm -hmm. which I, uh, I, I really originally declined because my dad, who was a small businessman, basically said that, you know, this was not going to be a profitable venture, particularly since they told me they couldn't pay me. Uh, they didn't have any money to pay me. They were just going to have on an account. So anyway, the long story short, the long story is in the book. The short story is 
And we ultimately did very, I ultimately did very well as advertising director. And when the reader held its 50th anniversary uh, special edition, the publisher, the original publisher of the reader credited the, the, the existence of the reader to two young men. One was their printer who was willing to uh, print the paper, you know, on credit. And the other one was me who helped bail them out of a financial hole they dug themselves by creating this profitable advertising program at the reader. Randy Barnett with us, his new book, A Life for Liberty, The Making of an American Originalist, and discussion about how you came to your points of view, discovering libertarianism. You say inside the chapter that you were converted by rational persuasion. What were those arguments central to you embracing the idea of libertarianism? Well, it was mainly consistency, I think. Um, I was already a libertary, a, a liberty-based conservative. I was a William F. Buckley conservative who had argued on behalf of Barry Goldwater when I was 12 years old. I had debated on behalf of him in front of my entire grade school and student and junior high school student body, several hundred students, uh, in 1964 when I was 12. And what appealed to me about Goldwater was um, the idea that uh, – Extremism and defensive liberty is no vice. Moderation in pursuit of justice is no virtue. That was Goldwater's line, and it captured my heart. In my heart, in my twelve-year-old heart, I I thought he was right, <laughs> um, and um, it went from there. But when I got to, co but I was always frustrated by conservatism because I couldn't find a definitive theoretical account of what it really was. I would re I read National Review. And I was a big fan of Buckley and Firing Line, but it was all just kind of uh, positions that seemed to be loosely associated with each other, uh, associated, with, associated with each other. But when I finally heard a libertarian professor at Northwestern describe what it was, it occurred to me that, well, this was the rational conservatism that I had been looking for. And I still think it's actually the rational conservatism that conservatives are looking for, if it's properly understood. And so that was kind of what got me. It was being consistent about liberty. Those were the rational arguments that were appealing to me. How are you consistent in your commitment to individual liberty, even when it might go against some of your personal preferences? You write uh, later uh, about being a libertarian in academia, handling the discrimination uh, you experienced growing up as a Jew was a good training for the discrimination that you would now experience as an academic libertarian. And later on in the book, there's discussion about how you nearly landed a spot at Northwestern. How would you describe your experience inside the academic world? And what is the hurdles placed in front of you as an academic libertarian? Well, I do think one of the reasons I got to be who I am today, and I try to explain this in the book, is that I was never entirely 100% a part of any group that I was in. So while I was growing up in Calumet City, Illinois, south of Chicago, in a Polish Catholic Democratic town, I was a conservative Republican Jew. <laughs> in my graduating class of 400, there were four Jews. And yet when I went to synagogue in Hammond, Indiana, across the state line, I was from literally the wrong side of the tracks. I mm -hmm. was from this D class A Calumet City place. And I was a conservative and they were all progressives or what, you know, liberals. Um, and so I was kind of on the outs with them and I was on the outs with my now I was very successful socially. I, I had a very happy childhood. But when you're not quite part of the group, you can see the group more objectively and find and sort of be critical of it. And Murray Rothbard once told me that that's kind of how intellectuals become intellectuals. And that has stayed with me as I went into academia as a libertarian and eventually as an originalist, although I didn't start off as an originalist, I was able to see things that other people didn't see. And that sort of made me look smart because I had a perspective they didn't have. And I have had to deal with discrimination in the course of hiring and other things. But ultimately, I've been able to achieve the very kind of career I always hoped I would. And one of the lessons of the book is you can overcome these obstacles if you just stick to it and don't give up. Randy, you mentioned you're growing up in Calumet City, south of Chicago, really, as you say, more culturally a portion of northwest Indiana than the Chicago area. But you eventually uh, become a, a prosecutor in the Cook County State's Attorney's Office. That's the county that includes Chicago, too. I was wondering, as I read, as a libertarian, was it difficult to be in a state's attorney's office when you might be prosecuting or working on cases with laws that as a, a libertarian, you say, why, why does this law even exist? Why, why are we prosecuting people for this type of crime? 
Well, yes, that was a problem, a potential problem that it turns out during the four years I was there, I actually did not literally have to confront. Hmm. The reason being that I worked for a Republican state's attorney who believed that, for example, marijuana laws uh, needed to be treated more uh, gingerly and essentially didn't put people in jail for violating marijuana laws. And with respect to other drug laws, um, I just never had an opportunity or the, uh, to prosecute drug laws. Then by my fourth year, Richard Daley came in, uh, the Democrat Richard Daley came in to be state's attorney running on a hard on drugs policy, but then he took all the drug crimes and he gave them to a special drug unit to prosecute. So once again, even as a felony court prosecutor, I didn't have to prosecute those crimes either. So, and that changed because they ended up uh, prosecuting so many people for drug offenses that all, all prosecutors had to do it, but I was already gone hmm. at that point. So I was in there in a very narrow window of time when the only laws I had to prosecute were ones I fully believed in, murder, rape, armed robbery, the kind of laws that the Cook County State's Attorney's Office doesn't prosecute anymore, <laughs> um, or at least doesn't prosecute to the full extent that we used to. Randy Barnett with us. A Life for Liberty is his new memoir, The Making of an American Originalist. Uh, chapter on developing your libertarianism and the subject of natural rights and first principles. How are natural rights connected to the problems of knowledge, interests, and power? Wow. Well, I didn't see that question coming. That is the, that's a big question. That is the question that I answer in my very first monograph called The Structure of Liberty, Justice and the Rule of Law that was published by Oxford University Press in 1998. And there I say that the rights that we have, at least some of the major reasons why we have the rights we have, why they are natural rights, is because they are needed to address this, the conditions that human beings find themselves in in the real world. That is, they are based on the nature of human beings and the nature of the world in which we find ourselves. And in that world, when you have a society, all societies must somehow come to grips with these three categories of social problems that I identify as problems of knowledge, problems of interest, and problems of power. Problems of knowledge, you know, listeners to this uh, podcast are going to recognize as the kind of Hayekian problem of knowledge, the idea that we as individuals know what we know and we need to put what we know into effect, mm -hmm. but we actually don't know a lot about, we are very ignorant about what everybody else knows. And so how do we structure society given that? And the problem of interest has to do with the problem of partiality and rent seeking and the, the, the natural tendency of people to aggrandize themselves. And finally, the problem of power, and I'm simplifying these a lot, Scott, sure, but sure. the problem of power is really about when you use coercion to solve the problems of knowledge and interest, you introduce a new problem, and that is how do you control the, the coercion that you're now using to protect the individual rights necessary to solve the problems of knowledge and interest? And that's the reason, that's when constitutions and constitutionally limited government starts to come into the picture. Randy Barnett, A Life for Liberty is the memoir. There's a wonderful story about a moment, a day, a conference that changes your life at the Federalist Society and eventually ends with you getting the nickname Mr. Ninth Amendment. The story is wonderful to read in the book, but thumbnail it for us. Why is this the moment that changed your life? Yeah, when I took constitutional law and my law professor was Larry Tribe, uh, I basically gave up on the Constitution. I was in a patriotic American. I believed in the Constitution. But in constitutional law class, I would go through the case book. And every time I got to one of the parts of the Constitution, like the Ninth Amendment, which says the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people, I thought, holy moly, what a great amendment that is. And then I would turn the page of the casebook and find out the Supreme Court had said, that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> Forget about that one. And that would be true of all the co power constraining parts of the Constitution, like the Second Amendment and like the Commerce Clause and, and the limits it has. And so by the time I was done with the course, I thought, well, this Constitution thing didn't really work out so well. I'm going to move on to more productive concerns. First of all, I'm going to be a criminal prosecutor and like I wanted to be from mm -hmm. a kid. And now I'm going to, when I became a law professor, I became a contracts professor where writings are still taken seriously. But then I got invited to speak at a the fifth annual student symposium of the then newly formed Federalist Society, which didn't exist unhappily when I was a law student. And it was a conference on the First Amendment, and I was on a panel on the, on freedom of association, which, by the way, is not mentioned in the First Amendment, and yet it's a constitutionally protected right. And as my punchline for my talk, I basically cited and quoted the Ninth Amendment that I just quoted for the listeners here. 
Now, I knew that that was actually a kind of an academically disreputable part of the Constitution to uh, to talk about. But mm-hmm. I thought, well, look, I got tenure now and I should be able to talk about any part of the Constitution that hasn't been repealed. So let me talk about the Ninth Amendment. But I didn't know anything about it. And after I got a very positive response from the audience of the Federal Society, which made me food me into the fact that the Federal Society was a coalition of conservatives and libertarians. I went back to my office and I had a research assistant go out and say, I said, find me everything that's ever been written on the Ninth Amendment. I'd like to know what's been written on it. And he came back with a pile of photocopies, maybe an inch and a half thick and a little book by a man named Bennett Patterson uh, called The Forgotten Ninth Amendment. And I thought to myself, you know, if I read everything in that pile of papers, that would auto overnight make me the, lead, the nation's leading authority on the Ninth Amendment. And it wasn't that long, big a pile. So I read it. And uh, I became the nation's leading authority on the Ninth Amendment. um, And that was my first big uh, move into constitutional law. And it's ultimately what led me into the medical marijuana case that ultimately took me to the Supreme Court, where I argued in the Supreme Court on behalf of the use of medical marijuana in states where its use had been legalized. Randy Barnett with us, his book, A Life for Liberty. Now we return to my original question about originalism and the part of the book where we explore how you arrived here. What does that path look like for you to embrace originalism? Well, one of the things I should probably say about the book in general, and that is my life sort of covers the rise of libertarianism as a political theory. Mm -hmm. And I've been, I was deeply involved in it from somewhat almost the beginning. And it also covers the rise of originalism as a theory of constitutional interpretation, which I've been at almost from the beginning. And so the story of my life is kind of the story of these two movements. But how I got into originalism was probably completely unique. That is, I'm probably the only person who ever got into originalism because I read a book by Lysander Spooner (laughs) called The Unconstitutionality of Slavery that was published in 1845. Um, nobody else became an originalism originalist <laughs> for that reason. Um, I was not. I was not an originalist. I was. A, I would have called myself a Dworkinian after Ronald Dworkin's moral readings theory of uh, constitutional interpretation. Um, but I was teaching constitutional theory in a seminar, and there was a footnote in one of the articles that I had assigned my students that cited Lysander Spooner's The Unconstitutionality of Slavery, 1845. And I had known from about Spooner's essay called No Treason, The Constitution of No Authority that he published in the 1860s. It was an anarchist critique of the Constitution, which I read as a college student and found completely persuasive in that, in those days. Um, and I thought, what could this guy possibly – I didn't know he wrote anything else. And what could he possibly have said about constitu- the slavery being unconstitutional in 1845 before there was a 13th Amendment? So I asked the library, get me a copy of it. Turns out it was a 280-page book. And it was part of a six volume collected works of Lysander Spooner, who knew the guy wrote so much. And I read it and it was it was eye opening because in it he he postulated or he advanced a theory of what would today be called original meaning originalism in response to the anti-slavery activists who used original framers intent to make the claim that the Constitution was a covenant with death and an agreement with hell and therefore was immoral, and they advocated for the dissolution of the United States. Those were the Garrisonian anti-slavery people. Mm -hmm. And Spooner's response to them was, no, no, we shouldn't be looking at the framers' intent. We should be looking at the original meaning of the words they used. And according to those words, they don't even mention slavery. They don't even call slavery by its proper name in the Constitution. Now, I should say, because people don't, so people don't get misled, that after years of working on originalism theory, I ultimately concluded that Spooner was wrong <laughs> about whether slavery was unconstitutional before the 13th Amendment. But nevertheless, his theory, his approach seemed to be very promising. I said, this is something I can work with and ultimately worked it up into a theory that was culminated in my 2004 book, Restoring the Lost Constitution, in which I presented the original meaning theory of originalism as compared to the original framers intent theory. And today, Scott, all the judges who are on the court and all the justices who are on the court who identify as originalists, they all identify as original public meaning originalists. That is the dominant theory of originalism today. Hmm. I want to come back to that in a moment, but you mentioned the Gonzalez case, which is the medical marijuana case. It's how the book opens and the book closes or, or near the close of the book, you return to the Supreme Court in the Affordable Care Act case, the Obamacare case, National Federation of Independent 
business. And this is one that everyone knows is lost. Uh, Justice John Roberts, the chief justice, criticized for essentially rewriting the law to make it legal. But you say in A Life for Liberty that Chief Justice Roberts' opinion made constitutional law better in more important ways. So what is your reading of of how the majority opinion in that case changed constitutional law for the better? It is very weird. If you're a constitutional lawyer and you win your constitutional argument, you typically win the case. Uh And if you've lost the case, it's because you've lost your constitutional argument. But only in the NFIB versus Sebelius case, only in the Obamacare case, could you win, get five votes for your theory of why the individual insurance mandate is unconstitutional and still lose the case. (laughs) It just doesn't seem fair somehow. But we did win on our theory. And as a result of NFIB versus Sebelius, individual purchase mandates under the Commerce Clause are unconstitutional. That's what Chief Justice Roberts said in his opinion. Congress cannot make you do business with a private company for the rest of your life because it's convenient to its regulation of interstate commerce. All he upheld, he reread the he rewrote the statute to say it was reasonably possible, even though it was not the natural reading of the statute, it was which says regulation and and penalty. He said it was reasonably reasonably possible to interpret the statute as basically giving you an option, a non-coercive option to either buy health insurance or pay a modest and non-coercive tax. And because it could be read that way and that way would be constitutional, it would not be a purchase mandate. He could uphold the Obamacare uh, statute as a whole. So that's how we won on our, our legal principle and we lost the case. But I want to say that both in this case and the Rage case, and I'm a little self-conscious about this because I my book, as you say, opens with the Rage case, the medical marijuana case, and it closes or nearly closes with this case. Both of them look like losses. So mm-hmm. how can I be so proud of them? <laughs> but in fact, both cases, um, the big the big victory here was to turn back the government's theory about why they should win. Um, And which was endorsed by virtually all academics. And that is that Congress has essentially a national problems power that allows it to do whatever it deems convenient to address any national problem. That is their reading of the Commerce Clause and the Necessary and Proper Clause. And it was their reading in essentially both cases. And in both cases, we got the court, I got the court, we got the court to reject that reading of the Constitution, reaffirm that the Constitution is one of limited and enumerated powers. And that itself was a major victory in the course of uh, getting those two losses. Randy Barnett's book, A Life for Liberty, The Making of an American Originalist. All right, so an originalist majority on the Supreme Court is what we have. I am curious, what's the leading competing theory to originalism right now? on the court. When you read a dissent from Justice Kagan, Justice Sotomayor, is there a controlling theory that you see developing in the minority on the on the court or even elsewhere in the federal court system at this time? That's a great question. And until recently, I probably would not have been able to answer it um, because basically the other view is living constitutionalism, that the meaning of the Constitution evolves with time. There's a lot of people who hold that view, but they usually won't admit it. Mm -hmm. There is developing, I think, a more coherent alternative to originalism. And it's something that my co-author, Larry Solomon, and I call constitutional pluralism. And this is the idea that original meaning is just one of many considerations that justices and judges should take into account in deciding constitutionality, but it can be overcome by other considerations, like, for example, stare decisis, meaning precedent or severe consequences. And so it grants original meaning has a role to play. It just doesn't think it wins when in conflict with other things that might over outweigh it. And I think that constitutional pluralism is probably the main alternative. And in fact, somewhat, uh, you know, uh, to our disappointment, conservative justices will use constitutional pluralism as well. Justice Alito, who identifies as an originalist, in his in several of his opinions, they are really written more like constitutional pluralist opinions in which originalism plays a role, but not a definitive one than originalist opinions. I don't know that he really is a pluralist, but some of his opinions are written as though he is. 
It's an interesting book and a really fun read along the way. Randy Barnett is professor of constitutional law at Georgetown University Law Center, directing the Georgetown Center for the Constitution, and his memoir is out now, A Life for Liberty, the Making of an American Originalist. Randy, thank you so much for joining us here on the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Well, this was a lot of fun, Scott. I really appreciate it. That will wrap up this edition of the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Our thanks to Dr. Joe Postel from Hillsdale's Politics Department and Randy Barnett, his brand new book, A Life for Liberty. The Radio Free Hillsdale Hour is recorded at the studios of WRFH, the student-run radio station at Hillsdale College. You can hear new episodes every week on this station. You also can find extended versions of some of our interviews or listen anytime to the podcast. Find it at podcast.hillsdale.edu or wherever you get your audio. Until next week, I'm Scott Bertram, and this has been the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour.